Tigers are an endangered species around the world, yet the truth is there are more tigers in cages in America right now than there are tigers in the wild. And guess what? The caged tigers in the U.S. are all psychologically damaged. How PETA is trying to fix America's tiger problem, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, the cub petting industry in America is creating a tiger mental health problem. It separates tiger cubs from their mothers for profit, and it's dangerous for both people and tigers. What you're really ending up with are some really psychologically messed up adult tigers. And some of these exhibitors are under the misimpression that these are tame animals, when in fact mm. they're not. They're, they remain deadly predators who can kill a human with the swipe of a paw, and sometimes that's what happens. And experts have found, too, that it's not just this individual tiger, him or herself, who's being affected, but it can actually impact the brains of future generations. So you're, you're potentially, you know, by inflicting this abuse on these animals, um, you're, you're potentially impacting their entire line if, if they're bred, which many of them are. Pete is Brittany Pete of the PETA Foundation's Captive Animal Law Enforcement Division, C-A-L-E, also known as CALE. We'll hear more from Brittany, but first, thanks again for joining us here for this special edition of the PETA Podcast. We're, we're dry, no music, but please, it's the same show. Share a link with friends. Let them know the animals have a voice on the PETA Podcast. And if you just found us, welcome. Keep binging. There's lots to listen to on the PETA Podcast. You'll notice that the horse racing season is Turn to the, the summer uh, up in Saratoga and Del Mar, lots of big issues. And it's become the biggest and hottest animal rights topic of late, with real changes occurring nationally after dozens of horse racing deaths at California's Santa Anita racetrack since December 2018. Now, PETA has pressed for both the DA's investigation and legislative action, including a call to shut down racing at Santa Anita. Check out our racing episodes, 74, 67, 60, and 53, to learn more about the issue. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, there's also a link to a survey in our show notes if you're so inclined. We'd love to hear your feedback. And if if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode. If you go by any roadside zoos that feature attractions like cub petting, well, don't patronize them. When it comes to tiger cubs, it's the leading cause of a real tiger problem in America that few people realize exists. That there are more tigers in the U.S. in cages than there are in the wild is a cruel fact. It was created in part by lax rules that empowered a subculture of animal entrepreneurs like tiger purveyor Joe Passage, a.k.a. Joe Exotic, to profit from tiger exporting and breeding. Brittany Pete talks about how PETA is trying to put a halt to the trade before more tigers and people are hurt. How could there be more tigers in cages in America than there are throughout the world? I mean, running wild. I mean, it just seems odd that that might be a fact. You know, unfortunately, it is a fact. And the vast majority of tigers who are held in captivity are held in decrepit roadside zoos. And, and it's all because of this insidious tiger cub petting industry where roadside zoos allow members of the public to have their photos taken with baby tigers for money. Um, and the tiger cubs can only be used for a few months before they're discarded and another tiger cub has to be brought in. So this industry creates this cycle of, of abuse that has resulted in this huge captive tiger overpopulation crisis in the United States. So captive tigers, I mean, these are tigers who are actually full-size tigers. They go from cubs to full-size. And once they're done being 
used in this petting situation. What do they do? I mean, they do they become as adult tigers? Do they go to zoos? What do they, what happens to them? There are a variety of different outcomes for for tiger cubs who who are discarded by the cub petting industry. Uh, some of them are uh, used as breeding machines themselves. Um, some of them are shipped off to other roadside zoos where they languish in tiny cages for the rest of their lives. Um, some are used in circuses or, or other entertainment. But um, but what we've been what we've been told by industry insiders is that they don't like to use uh, tigers who've been handled uh, by humans as cubs. Um, because that that makes them sort of more friendly and soft and um and not as easily affected by the the really harsh physical punishment that circus trainers use. So we don't see that as much. Other times they're just relegated to tiny cages at the roadside zoos where they came from. In other cases they're sold off to private owners where they may live the rest of their lives in a backyard or or in a basement. Um, and in some cases, I was told by Joe Exotic himself that a number of exhibitors that do tiger cub petting simply kill the cubs when when they're mm. no longer useful. Yeah, we're, we're going to get to Joe Exotic in a second. But you said something about this tiger petting industry. There's something that happens. Like, is this is sort of a consequence of that. When you're nice to the cubs early, you pet them, they don't become tigers. They become something else, right? They become really de somewhat domesticated, don't they? There, there are some misconceptions about that. So domestication is, is a process that happens over thousands and thousands of years. So, you know, these, these, these tigers who are exposed to, to humans at an early age certainly aren't domesticated, um, but it does, uh, it does impair their, their brain function, their psychology, um, and experts have told us even, you know, potentially their biology going forward, um, mm. because, because they can only be safely used when they're babies, the cubs are taken from their mothers days, sometimes even hours after they're born. When in the wild, they would stay with their mothers for around two years. And so when they're, when, when they're prema pre prematurely separated in this way, they're missing out on crucial learning opportunities to 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 really learn how to be a tiger from their mothers there are certainly certain things that are that are instinctual um but there is a lot that that these animals learn from their mothers so um and then you compound that with the lessons often through harsh physical punishment from the exhibitors that are exploiting them for profit um, you know, and what you're really ending up with are some really psychologically messed up adult tigers. And some of these exhibitors are under the misimpression that these are tame animals, when in fact mm. they're not. They're, they remain deadly predators who can kill a human with the swipe of a paw. And sometimes that's what happens. But essentially, we end up with. As you say, tigers with a psychological problem, we have a mental health problem for tigers right now in right. America because of what we're doing. And we don't know what to do with it because the people just see them as, oh, we're, we're petting these tigers. And then when they get old, they're, they're all screwed up. It's like we have these bipolar tigers in America or something. And experts have found, too, that it's not just this individual tiger, him or herself, who's being affected but it can actually impact the brains of future generations. So you're, you're potentially, you know, by inflicting this abuse on these animals, um, you're, you're potentially impacting their entire line if, if they're bred, which many of them are. And, and all of this, to go back to the, the headline about there are more tigers in America in cages than there are roaming the world, because tigers are basically endangered, mm -hmm. right? Throughout the they world. are endangered. Yes, they are. And there's okay. how many throughout the world? Estimates are uh, around a, a few thousand, maybe three thousand or so across remaining across across the world. 
just running around, born free, living as tigers, growl, you know, growling and being wild, right? Four thousand around around the world. Yeah, it's it's a it's around that. Yeah, and you know, of, of course, it's it's difficult to calculate that number, but like a lot of species uh, that are endangered, there are really serious habitat loss problems, and you know, there are more and more tigers dying every day as a result of conflicts with humans. Mm -hmm. And these are tigers in, mostly in Asia, I presume, right? Right. Who are right. running or who are, are wild and free. And yet in America, if there are 4,000 in Asia who are living normal tiger lives, in America, there's at least that many or more in cages, tigers? That's right. And and again, we don't know we don't know the exact number. Some estimates put the number of tigers in captivity in the United States at 10,000. Um mm. but the fact is we just don't know because because we really aren't regulating. We aren't regulating the private ownership of tigers. So um so while we may, you know, we 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 know that there, you know, that there are maybe around 5,000 captive tigers who are in USDA licensed facilities that's something that that's a number that that we that we know we don't know how many tigers are being held by private owners um, because those numbers just aren't available because they generally aren't regulated certainly not by the federal government and there are still um, three or four states that have no laws whatsoever relating the, to the private ownership of tigers, and and most of the states that do, um, it's just a, mat a matter of getting a twenty five dollar permit. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th there are some places that require dog licenses and things like that, and you spay or neuter sure. your dog, but n n nothing requires you to license your tiger or spay or neuter your tiger. Some of these jurisdictions across the country, there are more restrictions on having a, a dog than there are on having a dangerous predator like a tiger in your backyard. And on top of it, we have, because they're in cages and because most of them, most all of them have been through this petting zoo experience, they're mm -hmm. all screwed up mentally, psychologically, these tigers. That's right. I mean, you know, cap captivity... Captivity is going to have a psychological, a negative psychological impact on a far ranging wild animal like a tiger. Anyway, these are animals who have home ranges of hundreds of miles in the wild and they spend a, a huge amount of their time roaming vast distances in the wild. And so when you lock them up in a cage, you're going to mess them up anyway. But these are animals who didn't even have the benefit of being able to learn from their mothers and get these crucial life lessons at a young age. Um, so it's, it's even more serious. And, and that's why PETA has, is, is really taking on this tiger cub petting industry as a top issue. And we have two lawsuits pending right now in federal court um, challenging tiger cub petting under the Federal Endangered Species Act. We're alleging that prematurely separating tiger cubs from their mothers and using them in tiger cub petting operations and then putting them in these completely inadequate cages without environmental enrichment violates the Federal Endangered Species Act. Because ultimately, that's, what's con th th that's the thing that should be controlling all these 10,000 tigers, right? Or that should be regulating what happens to these 10,000 tigers, right? The, the, the Endangered Species Act? That's right. So, so there isn't a permit that's required under the Endangered Species Act to possess a tiger, but the Endangered Species Act does apply to, to every tiger in the United States. And so this is a way for, for us to create precedent to wipe out this entire industry. And also to create a system where there is some kind of responsibility that would, you know, help the tiger. That would be, we're talking about tiger rights here, I guess, huh? We are. We're, we're trying to create a chilling effect. We're trying to create the precedent and we're, we're trying to, to prevent this from happening in the first place. And if we can get this precedent on the books, 
with tigers, it also helps our efforts to try to stop similar cub petting with lions, with bears, and with primates, because it's just as cruel for those animals. It just happens to be most prevalent with tiger cubs. Really, at the heart of this is this idea about, well, who should have a right? I mean, I talk about tiger rights, but I'm sure there are people who Mm -hmm. might be listening and say, well, we have a right to have tigers if we want them. We're Americans. We can bring our tigers over here and we can, we, we should be able to have them roaming in our backyards, right? And so there, there are people who believe in tiger rights for themselves rather than, than the tigers. Oh, that's absolutely right. And the people who own tigers, in my experience, more than owners of any other exotic species, are quite rabid about their, their opinions on their so-called rights to own these dangerous predators. Well, it's almost like they equate the tiger to uh, like a second amendment right to a gun. You know, it's our right to be able to have these tigers. We could do with with them what what we will. And if we want to start a petting zoo, we'll have, you know, we'll do a petting zoo. But that's when you have these problems when the the cubs grow up and they can't like freeze them in time. And and these people either don't consider or don't understand the psychological and physical impacts that are being inflicted on both the cubs and the mothers, because it's traumatic for the mothers too, to have their babies taken away from them. So they either don't understand these issues or they just don't care. And I think in most cases, it's the latter. They don't care because they see these animals as nothing more than chattel that they can profit from. And that's why we see exhibitors killing tiger cubs because they're not useful to them anymore. When when you talk about the tigers coming over, they they get the tigers and, and there's this lack of regulation. But is it because the tigers here aren't aren't seen the same as the wild tigers in in um in Asia that they're somehow some kind of generic variant and and not covered by the endangered species is that the argument that you know these are these tigers in America in cages and in the industry are just fall short of being protected as an endangered species or am i am i reading that correctly there are a couple of issues there So the roadside zoo operators that are doing these tiger cub photo ops like to talk out of both sides of their mouths when they're discussing this particular part of the issue. On the one hand, they argue that the aim of their businesses is to conserve tigers and to produce more tigers who could be eventually released into the wild and to educate the public about these magnificent animals. On the other hand, when it comes to the Endangered Species Act, they say, oh no, oh no, our tigers are subspecies hybrids. They're not Bengal tigers. Um, they're, they're subspecies hybrids. And so they're, they shouldn't be covered under the Endangered Species Act. Well, according to the, according to the law, generic tigers, subspecies hybrid tigers are covered under the Endangered Species Act. So while roadside zoo operators may want to argue that there's a distinction. There isn't a distinction under the law, which, which is what allows PETA to be able to file these lawsuits. And, and so they're fighting back the roadside zoos, right? I well, mean, they're, they're not... They're trying this- to. Sure, they're trying to. And, and none of, neither of the facilities that we're currently suing has agreed to settle. But we've We've had tremendous success with these lawsuits so far. In one case, our lawsuit against a facility called Wildlife in Need in Indiana, PETA secured a preliminary injunction at the beginning of the lawsuit in which the judge ordered the facilities to halt the premature separation of baby tigers from their mothers and the use of tiger cubs in that facility's photo op encounters with the public. And in order to make that finding, the judge had to establish that PETA had a likelihood of success on the merits, which essentially means that uh, that it seems like we will win. 
Now that isn't a foregone conclusion. We still have to prove our case, but it was a great first step. We also, in that case uh, in which the exhibitor actually declawed the tiger cubs that he used in his encounters, which is a, a cruel mutilation involving the amputation of the, um, the essentially the tiger's finger at the first knuckle. It's painful and it causes lifelong complications, in, including lameness. And Petus actually sued the veterinarian that performed these amputations on some of the cats, at least two of, who di- of whom died as a result of the procedure. And we were able to achieve the, a first of its kind consent judgment that declared that declawing any threatened or enja- endangered cat violates the Endangered Species Act. So we've already had a big victory in that case. And we expect to be going to trial by the end of the year. So Pete is involved in all these things, but justice takes time. In the meantime, there are people who have these exotic facilities and they continue to do their, their, their thing. And, uh, and we still have tigers out there who are subject to all the conditions of these, of these petting zoos. That's right. That's right. And so PETA takes a multi-pronged approach to this issue, just as it does with all issues. And so at the same time that we're working on pushing these lawsuits through the courts, we're also working on educating the public and, and telling the public why this is wrong. Anytime we see a celebrity post photos of themselves with a tiger cub on Instagram, we reach out behind the scenes and educate them about not only why it's wrong, but why it's wrong to send this mes- message to their followers. So we're, mm-hmm. we're trying to do as much as we can to educate the public, because ultimately, if the public stopped buying tickets to these events, this industry could end tomorrow. So we're, we're trying to attack this industry, both, you know, sort of from the supply and the demand side to To do everything that we can to uh, to put a stop to it. So when you see someone like the Trump family, uh, you know, showing shots of them with wild animals, that doesn't help things at all. And and in the case of of the Trump family, it's primarily the Trump sons posing with with dead African wildlife, and it does a great disservice to wildlife and to conservation efforts and to these sorts of, and and to our efforts to try to put a stop to the exploitation of animals in the United States, um, to see these prominent people posing next to dead animals. Now, what about the USDA's role? Uh, Do do they have a role in trying to, uh, to, to stop or to to regulate what's going on with the tigers who are involved in the petting industry? Well, the USDA absolutely has a role to play. Unfortunately, to date, uh, they've been MIA on on their Mm -hmm. role. Uh, Like a lot of the the things that uh, the USDA is supposed to do, their mandate from Congress is to ensure the humane treatment of animals who are who are used in a, a number of different industries, including exhibition, which includes tiger cubs who are used in, in encounters with the public. Unfortunately, um, the USDA has a terrible record of accomplishing its own mandate. Uh, its own Office of Inspector General has repeatedly found that it's under-enforcing the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, a coalition of animal welfare groups and uh, even a few zoos submitted a petition for rulemaking to the USDA several years ago, asking them essentially to outlaw the uh, tiger cub petting industry along with bear cub petting and and, uh, primate photo ops. Um, But like a lot of other petitions for rulemaking that have been submitted over the past few years, um, it, it seems to be permanently on hold. So unfortunately, so if, the USDA is, is, not, is not helping these animals 
at all. And so it's falling to welfare groups and rights groups like PETA to try to come in and police this industry ourselves. And, and if the USDA is missing in action, what it does, as you say, what it does is it enables this subculture of animal enthusiasts, let's call them for a lack of a better term. They could be animal exploiters. It depends. But people like Joe Exotic, uh, a.k.a. Joe Passage. Joe Passage is his real name, but Joe Exotic. It enables them to do their thing. Joe Passage, Joe Exotic was was the sort of the central character in a recent Washington Post story. What was PETA's involvement in that story that was in the Post recently? Well, PETA worked with the Washington Post uh, over the course of around a year, providing background materials, records that we've received via FOIA and other public records requests, providing interviews and uh, documentation, photos and, and videos. Um, because we have a we have a very long uh, record of both investigating and and working on the case of Joe Exotic. Yeah, and so what basically for for people who aren't familiar with the story, we'll, we'll provide a link. But tell me the the uh, the the story of Joe Passage, or better known as Joe Exotic, and why is he a central figure in all this? For At least a decade, Joe was the most prolific provider and breeder of tiger cubs in the United States. I describe him as the spoke in the wheel of the tiger cub petting industry. Virtually every facility that did or does tiger cub petting in the United States was sourcing tiger cubs from Joe Exotic. At a lot of times, he had up to 200 adult tigers on his property at any one time. Mm -hmm. And for years, there were multiple USDA investigations relating to incidents in which, in one case, uh, it was 23 tiger cubs died over a short period of time. The USDA was investigating that. That investigation died on the vine. There were a couple of incidents in which um the USDA fined him. In one case, they suspended his license for a short time over uh, different violations of the Federal Animal Welfare Act, including abuse. And he was able to continue to operate. I consider the USDA to be an accomplice in Joe's years of abuse and neglect of tigers and, and other animals. He was engaging in these activities in plain sight, including wildlife trafficking. And eventually the law caught up to him, but not before he created a huge amount of suffering in untold numbers of tigers and other animals he shipped across the country to be used in these exploitive industries. And right now, is he in jail? Did he... Did the law catch up with him and and put him behind bars himself? Joe was ultimately convicted of two counts of murder for hire over a a scheme in which he was attempting to hire someone to murder the operator of a big cat sanctuary in Florida. And he was also convicted on 19 counts of uh, violating federal wildlife laws. A number of those counts were for trafficking in tiger cubs, and seven of those counts were from his killing of seven tigers at his facility, who he killed to make room for tigers he was uh, going to be taking in as boarding for a circus operator. Is he still in prison? He's currently in jail awaiting sentencing. And and yet... The fact that he's in the system and now he's he's been he's been caught, it hasn't really deterred others from doing what they do in the, the in the exotic pet industry, right? We've actually seen a huge decrease in the number of exhibitors that are engaging in tiger cub photo ops since since Joe has been charged. I think on the one hand, it's simply that the supply has dried up 
because you don't have this prolific breeder transferring cubs all over the country. Um, his former business partner who now operates uh, the, the zoo that Joe ran is still breeding. And, and so it's an open question on whether he'll take over that role. Um, but I think also Joe's charges and ultimately his conviction have shown these other exhibitors that they're not immune and that it, and it confirmed the fact that what they're doing does violate the law and they they've all operated with impunity for so long i think that they thought that they were immune um but the fact that joe is now sitting in a cage himself i think has had a chilling effect on some of these exhibitors uh, joe passage joe exotic is kind of a character is there something that uh, you can say runs through most of the people who get involved in this sort of thing that you can say, well, yeah, that's, there seems to be this trait that you can point to? In my experience, at least the men, and it's almost all men who get into this industry have, they're narcissists. They are desperate for attention. And they're trying to portray themselves as having an inordinate amount of machismo. And what is more macho than getting into a cage with a tiger? That seems to be the image that they're trying to portray. And in my experience, that's the sort of person who gets into this industry. But you said that the, the impending imprisonment of Joe Passage, uh, Joe Exotic, is ha has had a chilling effect. So that's uh, a positive. Absolutely. And I think that, to be fair, it's not just Joe's incarceration. I think that, that that has definitely had a big impact. But to PETA's credit, I think that our lawsuits have also had a tremendous chilling effect. We've gone after two of the biggest operations doing tiger cub petting in the industry, We've shut down one of them, at least while our case is going forward. And these federal lawsuits cost a lot of money. And so I think a lot of them just don't want to have to potentially deal with the trouble of facing a, a very expensive federal lawsuit from PETA. Aside from the lawsuits and, and you know law enforcement and the USDA getting some teeth and going after these people and regulating them, the public has a role. They can just not patronize these places, these exotic uh, petting places, right? And really, that is, that's the most important point. That's the most important takeaway of this. We could shut down this industry tomorrow if the public would simply stop buying tickets. It's really as simple as that. Brittany Pete, director of Kale with the PETA Foundation. Thank you very much for being on the PETA Podcast. Thank you so much. And that's our show for today. Brittany Pete is the director of PETA's Captive Animal Law Enforcement Group. See the story on Joe Exotic in the Washington Post and see what you can do to save the tigers. Go to PETA.org for more. And that's our program. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amuk or on aldef.org slash blog or my website, amok.com. And as a personal note, come to see my one-man show if you're in the D.C. area. A meal amok, all pucked up, Harvard, NPR, and more. It's at the Capitol Fringe in D.C., various dates from July 20th through 28th. Go to my website at amok.com for links to tickets. I tell the story of my father's colonization, his immigration from the Philippines to America, and my journey to Harvard and the media, and how it was my own form of uh, journey through colonial history of sorts. Uh, everyone has a go-home exclusion story, a complicated story of America. This is mine. Come see it. Emil Amuck at the Capitol Fringe. Once again, thank you for listening to our program. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world 
on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.